Hello, and welcome to the OpenCV AI for Entrepreneurs podcast. My name is Anna Petrovicheva, and I'm the CTO of OpenCV.ai. Today, I will talk to Laya Kliatar, who is the CEO and co-founder of Green Waves Technologies. They are a company based in France. They create a processor that is named GAP8, which can run on battery power and do artificial intelligence uh, computations. So this is a very ultra-low power technology that is going to disrupt the market of intelligence sensors. I've been working with Loic and his team for quite some, quite some time now and absolutely admire the product that they make as well as their work culture. So please welcome Loic Leotard. Okay, so like I'm really, really happy to talk to you in our podcast. Uh, and the first question that I'm going to ask is about the company that, that you are running, about the Greenbase Technologies. So could you please tell us about how did you come up with the idea and how did you decide to found the company that creates such an innovative and low power chip technology? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for the innovation. Now the company is, uh, we are a semiconductor company, we make processors. Uh, the company was founded six years ago, almost. And as a matter of fact, it was not founded for what it is today. Originally, we had to plan to make high data rates, ultra low power wireless connection. And this was the first year of the company. And as we were looking, and by the way, our CTO Eric was not on board at the time. He was a good friend, but uh, he knew what we were doing. He was not on board. But as we were looking for uh, a processor architecture, to run those algorithms for high data rate wireless connection, um, Eric wanted to set up his own company and asked me to join on board and be uh, the CEO of that company. And I told him I could not be two CEOs at the same time, but we had offices and he was more than welcome to uh, uh, sit, sit with us and, and work uh, side by side with us. And after a couple of months, uh, it's funny because he told me, you know what, I think my processor idea would be a good fit for your uh, communication needs. Uh, so we did some due diligence, of course. We probably, it was a, a month or two. And afterward, we concluded that, yes, he was right. So the processor that today is our first product, Gap8, was a good fit to run those communication algorithm. And Eric joined the company. We had dinner, as usually in France, to make decisions with my chairman, Eric, and myself. And we decided to merge the two projects, and Eric joined as, uh, as a, another co-founder, but uh, technically one year later. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, the seed round, we raised money on, on his project, which was to make an ultra low power AI processor for the very edge of the network and the communication technology that we had. And later on, the market decided there was much more traction on Eric's original idea than on the communication idea. And GreenWave became what it is today, which is a company that makes ultra low power processor for analyzing analyzing rich data with AI methods, but on top of We, from day one, we thought that the traditional BSP uh, was and would remain important on any uh, heavy duty uh, processor. So today we do well AI, but we also do well uh, traditional signal processing. And inter interesting enough, the, the recent traction that we are finding uh, not in the IoT this time, but in uh, Hero Gold, is proving a slide because the DSP side of the processor is uh, very appreciated by your customers. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so my next question is going to be about the company culture. So how do you build a team that is capable of creating such a breakthrough technology? Ah, that's... Uh, first of all, we decided, with Eric, we, the idea is we want to have fun. Uh, we want to enjoy life. We don't want to, from day one, we didn't want to repeat what we dislike in large companies. So uh, everybody, we, we have this very strong vision. And I had this morning uh, my monthly meeting. I repeated that as we are at the cornerstone of the company with our next tape out coming out in two months. The company is, is made of agents. So everybody is empowered. They know what, they have to know what uh, they have to do. They have to align with each other. So it's really a bottom-up organization than uh, a top-down organization. And, and we think about it very, very deeply. Uh, it's, it's very demanding also intellectually because there is no available model to refer to. Uh, but so far, so, so far, so good. It has worked pretty well. 
The second point is that I think there is a great uh, combination of extremely senior people, people who have done it several times, understand the whole industry. Semiconductor is a very thick industry. And young, enthusiastic people, uh, now we have all the competences that we, know we need to, to do the job. So it's really a matter of how you mesh those competences to, uh, to execute. And this is really about the execution side. Now your question, I think, was more on the innovation side, and and uh, but you don't build anything if you don't execute. Often we have this romantic view that startup is about new things, new idea. Uh, sure, but this is only five percent. Ninety-five percent is about execution, and because you are, you know, a bunch of people against uh, gigantic companies, you have to execute perfectly and very efficiently. On the innovation side. Uh, it's really coming from the relationship we have with two world-class academic research centers, uh, ETH in Zurich and University of Bologna. And the team, of course, and a number of our guys are coming from there. And we work seamlessly with them. And the reason for which we are able to work seamlessly without, for example, uh, research money getting into in the picture or intellectual property getting into picture is that we are leveraging open source projects. So most of what they do and what we do with them is open source. Uh, and as such, it's, it's a, a something that is a product for us, is, is a, a test chip for them that they will use in academic uh, publication. It's the same object, and this open source allows us to work together on the same, same object. Uh, it's really that, that combination. It's not easy. It's an effort of every day. To make it work, we have also a number of our employees that are uh, part-time employees of the university. Uh, the head of those labs is a shareholder of the company, and I think this is where the innovation and the stream of innovation is coming from. Now, as the company grew, of course, uh, we are more and more intimate with some of our markets and some of the very deep innovation. And we have a recent example in the audio space that we are patenting ourselves. This is proprietary to the company. It's not coming out of the um, relationship with the, the research centers. And this innovation stream is coming from our understanding of the market. Got it. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I mean, this combination of uh, industry and technology, I think I totally agree that this is the point where all the innovation happens, right? But the, is the open source is, is, is obvious in the software industry. Uh, but it was not the case 30 years ago. Probably you are too young to remember. Uh, but in semiconductor, this is really leading edge stuff. I think we are the company that has taken it to the most extreme. So RIS-5 is a big buzz those, uh, those days. RIS-5 is not about open source. It's about free instruction set architecture. But it has enabled uh, the ETH and University of, of Bologna to build this open source project out of which uh, green wave technology has come out. So let's talk about the risk fee itself. Uh, what, what, do you what do you think is the future of the technology? Because uh, right now the technology is emerging at a rate that is probably unprecedented in the world uh, for a hardware technology like that. So I'd like to, uh, uh, could you please share your opinion on what is the future of the risk fee standard? Um, as an architect. I have, I have a very strong opinion about it. Uh, first of all, there is a big buzz. Uh, the the RIS-5 Foundation and the founders, we are not a founding member of the RIS-5 Foundation. We are one of the first ones that not a founder. They have done a great job. There is a huge momentum. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, uh, it has been adopted for deeply uh, embedded application which means that you find RIS-5 in many of the big chips of big companies, but they are processors that they use for themselves to control their chip. They are not processors available to their customers to uh, develop programs and run it on RIS-5. And this is, by and large, the uh, highest use of RIS-5 today, commercially, of course. Then, then RIS-5 is a fabulous tool for research. So, I, uh, one of uh, our, our academic friends was saying that the number of uh, academic paper on processing architecture has been multiplied by 10 since RISC-5 is out, because it's a great platform for researchers to start from something that is already half-baked and innovate out of it. 
Uh, a bit disappointingly, I must say, if you look at uh, what I call commercial processors, so processors that are uh, that can be programmed by third parties, exactly what we do. We sell processors and our customers are programming them. Then the offer is very, very limited. Uh, I know about uh, a couple of companies in China. I know about server company in the US because a very ambitious project based on this file, and there is ourself. Uh, but there are very, very few. Uh, I think a number of people are making their own ASICs, and we are back to the deeply embedded uh, things. But on, on the open commercial uh, offer, it's, it's limited. And why is that? It's, it's difficult and complicated and long to build a commercial processor. You have to come with a complete offer. You have to explain to people and justify why is it that you have to abandon ARM because, again, it's, at the end, it's ARM versus Trisfy. There is no doubt about it. Uh, and frankly, why would you uh, drop ARM uh, if, if the architecture that you offer is not radically innovative? And RISC 5 by itself is slightly better than ARM, for sure. But the fact that it's freely available doesn't, doesn't bring anything. You don't have, or at least the, the guys who are selling the, the processor don't have to pay the few cents of royalties to ARM, but it doesn't change the economics. It doesn't change the economics. Where RISC 5 change everything is the ability to innovate. And my surprise is that there are very few companies that innovate architecturally uh, thanks to RISC 5 uh, We are one of them. I, I can't think of another one, this server company. And frankly, that's it. So maybe it will take a bit more time. Maybe things will come. But it is only to replace, say, in a microcontroller, an ARM microcontroller by a RISC 5 microcontroller and keeping everything else equal, I, I don't see the benefit for the market. And, and in, as a matter of fact, this is, this is not happening. We have seen a lot of test chip announcements, but in real life, in production, there are very, very few commercial RISC 5 processors. Understood. Um, I actually see a new angle to this uh, you know, market because um, this recent news on, of NVIDIA acquiring ARM may actually really affect the future of RISC-V in a very positive way, I think. So um, one of the possibilities is that uh, by like uh, as an aftermath of this deal, ARM basically becomes a US-based company and faces the China sanctions, right? Yeah, my com sure. My comment was was uh, purposely ignoring geopolitics. Now, geopolitics <laughs> is something that is, is, in my view, is beyond beyond us. So I, you know, yeah. I, I I can't build a pro company project on that. But of course, it helps. Of course, in China, RISC five is big. Of course, in Europe, uh, it starts to be big for some applications. For sure, the guys that are in the space business, military business, uh, are out very, very strong for, for RISC-5. But those are things that you don't master. So I, I, I would not build a rationale based on that. The people who launched RISC-5, they don't have that in mind, uh, yeah. for sure. But the geopolitics, it's, uh, it's uh, open source is, is the way to address the attempt of geopolitics to control the industry. There is no doubt about it. It's true for RISC-5, for the processor. It is true for the architecture so on top of the, the ISA. I think, and this is in our industry less talked about, it is also true for the CAT tools, so the, the software tools you use to design the integrated circuit. And, and for the time being, uh, there are three companies only in the world, and the three of, the, the three of them are American. And it's a big threat. Um, but the open source uh, solutions are not at all at the, at the level at which we need to have them to use them in uh, commercial products. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Okay, so um, about Risk V, could you please uh, uh, tell to our followers uh, some of the applications that you foresee will be the most popular for the Risk V architecture and the Risk V devices? Well, Risk V is, is is a processor like any other. So uh, again, I I think as I explained that deeply embedded controllers is the natural uh, spot for it. Uh, and here it will be endless. I don't know why someone would ever again buy an ARM processor for the embedded. And this is anything. This is anything. Now, beyond that, uh, maybe it's easier to, to list what I think RISC 5 will not get in. I think in established market, let's speak the smartphone. 
I see no rational, and, and I'm sure people will try, uh, no rational, leaving aside geopolitics, huh? no rational for the industry to switch from risk five, uh, arm to risk five. The same in automotive, the same in many areas. Where uh, risk five has a chance is where red classic architecture uh, cannot make it. When you have energy efficiency requirements, for example, that are beyond what a risk architecture can do. This is our case. Our case, we are not a risk, we are also a risk five company, but our merit is not coming from risk five. It's only an enabler. Uh, what is unique about the architecture is uh, it is uh, relatively parallel. We have uh, typically eight core work, loosely coupled working in parallel. It's hierarchical, so you have one plus eight cores and many other features. So risk five here is is it is not. We are not running applications uh, thanks to risk five. Risk five is allowing us or enabling us to develop an architecture that allows us to be much better than what a regular risk processor, whether it's ARM or RISC-V, would be. And this we can do with, with RISC-V, we could not do with ARM. This is really what where the difference is. So then if I go to, to what we do well, uh, what we do well is uh, our, our target market is devices that are battery powered, that have sent what we call risk sensors, typically camera, infrared camera, microphone, radar. Uh, the sensors that produce a lot of data and those data are analyzed and transformed locally so that the wireless communication uh, has to deal with a reduced stream of data that we call metadata the outcome of the analysis typically uh, and here you are you are back to classic uh, machine learning or deep learning inference type of solution we are not dealing with learning today and certainly your processor today are not capable of doing that so it will be about the, the simplest, but also one of the our most successful application is counting people in a room. So you stick a, an infrared sensor for privacy reason on a sailing, you snap a picture, relatively low resolution, 80 by 80, and our processor will uh, count the number of heads it's recognized in the picture. Uh, what we bring is that we can do it on a small battery for five years, one, one picture per minute for five years. This is, this is unique. And uh, the machine is not specialized, so also we can recognize the faces, we can locate the face, we can do face ID, and we do that with, with you, and thank you, Anna. Uh, but we also do keyword spotting, so we recognize words, and so forth. The, if you compare this type of architecture versus uh, more specialized architecture, uh, and to some extent, let's say our competitors, uh, our competitors tend to pick a vertical they think is important, and they will ultra specialize the architecture for that. For example, keyword spotting. Uh, we we think that in the uh, micro microcontroller uh, world which we are in, this is not the way to go. Those machines have to be good enough to do many things uh, for two reasons. The first one is frankly we don't know what would be the killer app. Now we have a, a better idea. I'm happy to come back to that after. Uh, the second one is that on the same processor, because this is the only processor of the system, you will want to run more than one algorithm. So you might want to run, uh, say, a, a machine vision algorithm to recognize a, a person, but also to recognize voice on the same architecture. The processor has to do a good job on both. Or you might want also to add a gesture recognition capability uh, based on the radar signature uh, recognition. And, and here again, that machine has to do all that together. And what we see, our, our last product is finding very good traction on uh, hearable, the, the earbuds. And, and here uh, you have heavy duty neural network algorithm running, but also heavy duty uh, traditional audio DSP running. And our processor does it all pretty well. Uh, indicatively, we are, if we compare ourselves in most of the market we are in against uh, competition, we are 10 to 20 times more energy efficient. Wow, that, that's, that's a magnitude of, uh, yeah, that, that is really going to disrupt the technology when once it gets uh, widely adopted, right? But as a startup, you need, I mean, if you are not 10 times better than established competition, you just don't make it. People rather, la <coughs> they would rather wait for the big guys to deliver the next generation product and work with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, so my next question is about the weird times we all live in now. Uh, how did the pandemic, this uh, global uh, situation, uh, affected the hardware market and risk the uh, devices maybe? And did it at all? Uh, at, at the semiconductor industry level, it's very strange because uh, first of all, the, on, on the manufacturing side, those guys operate in very stringent conditions that are more that are more stringent than confinement. To some extent, didn't change anything in the semiconductor way for fabs. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, strange. So the, the the industry went ahead, except for probably the automotive markets. The semiconductor industry has seen no slowdown. This is very surprising, but this is how it has, it has happened. Uh, in many countries, by the way, it has been also identified as strategic industry. So the factories were required not to shut down, which is which is that has been the case in other industries. Uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, of course, we are again we we are we are still very small. We have seen no uh, customer cancellation except one in Korea, because the customer itself was financially challenged because of the crisis. What we have seen is a slowdown on the projects because companies were not operating as nimbly as uh, they were before. Everybody was strong. In the end, we are in the hardware business. So when you have a customer developing a, a product, it's a piece of hardware, and, and, and you have to deal with a piece of hardware where everybody's at home. So we had funny things where we, we, we were shipping uh, uh, our reference design board to our customer's house but the oscilloscope was in the wrong place, and those things are delaying delaying projects. So that's oh, this is really about the operation. Then some projects have been delayed because uh, in in AI and, and a lot of our cases are about AI. It's about also experimenting in real life. It's about pox. So I, I mentioned as an example the people counting uh, application. Now at some point the customer has to deploy those sensors into offices. To make trials, so if the offices are empty, the trial cannot take place. So my assumption is that we are in the ramp up phase of sales, and I think uh, we were hit by a four months delay. So basically, the sales that I was planning to make this year, I will make them uh, toward the end of the year and the Q1 next year. But it's not dramatic on one hand, and on the other hand, we are uh, frankly lucky because. Uh, in the EU, but especially in France, uh, the financial instruments that have been put in place very, very rapidly to protect companies like ours have worked very well. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, we closed, uh, uh, it is uh, a week ago, a 5 million euro uh, COVID financing round that is mostly debt uh, that is coming out of the instrument that the state put in place. Congratulations on that. That, that's I have no idea. Really... It's really, it's really the the government that did the right job on that. Yeah, that, I must say. That, that's great, but I guess like there is also a positive impact uh, of this whole situation that, like I I see that uh, in two years perspective, uh, people will think more about automating things, right? About uh, deploying more robotics into place, uh, because right now we clearly see that some some things that. Uh, can be done. Can be done by machines. Should better be done by machines, right? I and that's funny. I don't have the same view. I think that trend is going on. I'm not sure that it will be uh, accelerated thanks to the crisis. Uh, on the other hand, and again, I'm biased by by what we do as a business and where we find traction. Uh, what I see is that a lot of technology will be put at work. To help people work no matter where they are. Uh, so of course everybody has a PC in the office and blah blah blah. But uh, you know, if I am in uh, in my home, now the sound might not be that good. Or the if I have a baby, the the, the sound of the baby will be in the background. Those days, we, we I mean, we love it. Uh, the world is on fire. I, I believe technologies are coming out, and we are contributing to that. To make sure that no matter where you are, you can work, you can discuss, you can exchange, you have also the closeness with people, you have uh, better, it's fascinating we, because of our traction in the rural market, I'm discovering that uh, the, the technology that we are using today for, for headsets is very, very primitive. There are many ways to 
to provide more, more life to the voice that you can have in your ear set. And the only thing that is, the science is there, the algorithms are there, and the only thing that is missing is the computing power with the right energy efficiency, which, which by the way, we are bringing. This is why we are so excited. But I see that, uh, that trend uh, uh, being, be, being brought in by the, by the pandemic, more than the robotization, I must say. Uh, this would really help to, at least to uh, capture podcasts while uh, people like you and me are distributed across the world and sit in different countries, right? Yeah. Okay, so my final question for today would be, what would you recommend to people who think about starting, um, creating a startup in the very competitive and very tough area of hardware engineering? What would you recommend to these people? Oh, that's a good point. I think really we, we are all obsessed and very romantic about technology. Technology is fundamental, but even more fundamental, you need to start with a very strong idea, a very strong vision of where the market is going that no one else believe in. And, and uh, a startup uh, is always going through missteps, you know, trial and error, it's normal, because you are building a, a social body that uh, you start from scratch. Um, and, and therefore, you, you have to make sure that your vision, and, and this can be only, uh, in my view, a market vision, uh, is, is you know, advanced enough and therefore, of course, risky, so that it can, it will uh, forgive the fact that here and there you have missteps. So the, those fundamentals have been very strong. Now it can be something very abstract. For example, the idea, and frankly, it was it was uh, in our case Eric that came with it, saying, you know, we will we will need to deliver uh, much more computing power in those battery powered devices than uh, we need today. Uh, to analyze data local, rich data locally. Okay, this was the vision, and and but we didn't say initially. We say we have to work on something, so we say it's IoT. Now it turns out that six years later, most likely for us, what will make our success is hearable. But it's the same vision, so we are just slightly changing the angle, not much more. But the fundamentals of battery power objects that have uh, not supercomputing uh, uh, capabilities, but but more than a smartphone on, on your butt. Can you realize that? Um, this this is, this has been an environment for the company in in, uh, in six in six years, and we have been extremely. Uh, I think for, for a long time we have been in a, in a radar mode. So then, when you have set the vision, you have to scan and try to understand where you get a signal on your radar. Where is it that the market resonates with you? Okay, what is also, and, and I think we almost made the, 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 the mistake, is that you should not try to make it too difficult. So in our case, for example, we are coming out with, with new concept technologically that we have to sell, Series 5, parallel architecture, blah, blah. Uh, it's AI that the people in the field, believe, believe me, most of our customers have an intuition that they need to deploy AI technologies, they don't know how to do it. So it takes them a long time to uh, decide to actually make a product and, and therefore uh, make sales for us. Uh, themselves are experimenting. And, and for a startup, this is challenging, right? Because you need, you need revenue. You cannot live on, on VC money forever. So also, ideally, your vision has to apply on an existing market and disrupt an existing market as opposed to help creating uh, a market. And in Europe, we are very romantic about that. I think other, other geographies are less. So we love the idea that we will invent a new market. Uh, for, for a startup, this is steep. If you, you, know, you have to build a team, build a technology, and wait for the market that you are enabling to realize. Uh, there are the chances to fail are, are pretty high. So, uh, have have a unique disruptive vision, but try to apply it to existing market. That would be my recommendation. Thank you so much. It was really, really a pleasure for me and a privilege to talk to you. And thank you. Right. Thank you, Anna. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.